Hello, bienvenue, pull up a stool. Tonight, I have a story for you about commerce, cocktails, and Canada. Because a hundred years later, the legacy of prohibition is ruining more than just your night out. Ah, the early 1900s. The prairies, producing endless quantities of grain for the British Empire's vast trade network. But try telling a farmer to not turn a little excess grain into some whiskey for himself. Or a sugar trader on their way to Britain to not transport a few crates of rum to the Maritimes. The whole country was sloshing with cheap and plentiful alcohol. Alcohol consumption was integrated into the workday. Beer wagons would just roll right into the grounds for industrial workers. How convenient. But the problem is this wasn't just skip the dishes for alcohol, it was also skip coming home after work, skip providing for your family, and skip not shitting your pants. So various labor groups like the Knights of Labor, religious and women's organizations, backed the prohibition of alcohol. World War I rationing started a de facto prohibition in Canada, in solidarity with the soldiery. Nice Canadians. At the end of the war, each province had a referendum to see if it wanted to stick with some form of prohibition. Everyone did, apart from Quebec. The story of Canada. Canada realized before the United States that banning alcohol was a stupid idea. Quebec's like, yeah, prohibition was the cash cow of organized crime and the lost tax revenues were catastrophic. But on the plus side, it helped break the acceptability of being blitzed all the time. Which is good for North America. I don't think we'd have managed the moon landing at the rate that things were going. That's one small sip for man, one giant. But naturally, it turned half the country into criminals and totally undermined the tax base. It took a long time to get past prohibition. PEI didn't emerge from it until 1948. Of course, that was 100 years ago, so it doesn't really impact us today. Actually, it does all the time. On the obvious side, legacy laws on the books meant that people could still get arrested for taking alcohol across provincial borders, but a big long-term impact has been very high vice taxes. These are taxes you put on bad things, like tobacco, gambling, Australians, and of course, alcohol. They discourage consumption and help pay for the damage that these things do, especially Australians. Great idea. Even before Prohibition, liquor was a big source of tax revenue for the government. And the tax rate's only grown over time. Today, when buying your standard 24-pack of North American Weedy Watersons Lager... Weedy Watersons, when you can't be bothered tasting... Anything from 32 to 53% of the price that you pay is taxes. But only about 10% of your drink is federal tax. Between 21 and 44% is provincial. Provinces like PEI, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia sit on the high end of the spectrum, whereas Alberta, Quebec, and British Columbia occupy the lower end. But when you add it all up, that's a lot of tax. <sighs> of course, the industry doesn't really like these taxes and lobbies <clears throat> against them. Fact. 47% of the price of beer is government tax. That's a lot for beer. That's unacceptable. Fact. It is literally a poison that makes people commit crime that is also addictive. Totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. When you think about it, they should probably just be happy that it's not being prohibited again, seeing as we seem to be redoing the 20s at the moment. But those extra provincial taxes make brewing and distilling ripe for tax breaks. What happens if we take a large but local brewery, the sort of place that makes a reasonably priced hoppy thing? Hopped up on hops! Hop you ready for hops? Hoppenheimer, I have become destroyer of taste buds! You're working hipster beer after a hard day manufacturing, excuses to go to a three-day conference in Vegas. This is where something interesting happens. Say you're drinking a Saint Ambois in a bar in Montreal. The provincial tax goes from around 24% to more like 11% of your drink. Levels of tax break vary massively from province to province. Steam Whistle in Ontario probably has a similar production volume to a lot of these beers, but their taxes are more like 22%. That means that when Steam Whistle comes to Quebec, on top of all the logistics and regulatory challenges, it's at quite a disadvantage. Despite this tax advantage though, you see very little Quebec beer in Ontario. Because the real protectionism in Canada is retail. 
Here I am outside a government-run cannabis shop. Here I am outside a government-run alcohol shop. Here I am outside a government-run tobacco shop. Just kidding. That would be stupid. Also, notice the one shop that doesn't have a line. <laughs> Remember Prohibition? I hope so, I just talked about it 3 minutes and 11 seconds ago. During Prohibition, liquor was still sold in pharmacies. Sorry kids, they ate a lot of medicine last night. Of course there were many long lines of people showing up with sore throats around New Year's. When Prohibition ended, the government didn't want to just return back to exactly what they had before. Beer wagon city, shitting the pants. So they decided to take it slow. Based on that pharmacy model, they created various liquor boards. These were legal monopolies owned and run by the government. So liquor sales could be carefully monitored. From undesirable beige rooms, alcohol was kept out of the hands of undesirable people. In Ontario, for example, customers had a license logbook, which clerks reviewed to check their buying history. It was at the clerk's discretion that they thought you were buying a little bit too much or just didn't like the look of you. The thought being that government sales would remove the profit motive from selling alcohol. Today, they are the last remnants of prohibition. Over time, the liquor boards have become less and less obvious. Setting up crown corporations and hiding their names, giving a little bit of direct retail to other businesses, and contracting state-sanctioned, privately-owned monopolies. This is where protectionism occurs between Canadian provinces, because liquor boards choose what gets mass-marketed. In Ontario, they decide what sort of wine will be bought in with tasting panels, and give preference to Ontario in wine and beers. Similar discrimination exists across Canada. It's often a multi-year process to gain access to Canada's largest markets. And really worth the effort for the low volume they might decide to ultimately buy if you're a craft brewery. Provinces like BC allow specialty importers. So you can usually find a famous Quebec microbrew like Peche Mortel in a specialty store. But generally the regulatory barriers raise the further east that you go. In Ontario, I could only find it for sale in the online shop of a bar and you had to buy food at the same time, which in itself is another lingering prohibition regulation. You can buy a bottle of drain cleaner to take home at the LCBO, but you have to get a burger if you want to take home a fancy beer. Sometimes out of province microbrews will show up in certain LCBOs, but yeah, we'd have to call around and check. Peche Martel is not on the LCBO price list, despite often being considered the best beer in Canada and being brewed right next door. Continuing our journey! By the time you reach Quebec, it's rare to see microbrews on shelves if they come from another province. Talking to one beer distributor in Quebec, he said that more of his beer was bought in Alberta than Ontario. It's crazy that it would even be a possibility. It's on the other side of the country and has like a third of the population. Now of course you can always custom order stuff. All you have to do is... Order from the supplier, arrange shipping through a private carrier, complete the paperwork, obtain electronic authentication from the SAQ, pay the required fee and deposit, so after a month or so, there's your flat of beer, only slightly stale and just a hundred times harder than going to the store. For the eastern provinces, they've effectively cut down interprovincial trade to the large breweries that have the expertise and volume to navigate this bullshit system. Two breweries in the Ottawa area made a point of this recently. They brewed the same beer on either side of the Quebec-Ontario border. Although it was the same, the barrier made it bad business for a brewer located here to sell to a merchant just across the river over here. The impact of all this is that you can often find Canadian beer across your province's southern border, but not to the east and the west. At the local level, we've got to the point that liquor boards often don't even store or touch the beer. Brewers and retailers seem to hate dealing with the liquor boards. Beer doesn't warehouse well and it's high volume, so the delays and the bureaucracy and the supply chain are particularly painful. They instead have an arrangement for direct brewery to bar and boutique delivery. But without a government employee running the warehouse, driving the truck or staffing the till, chaos reigns. Not really. Taxes get paid and everything is fine because this is fucking Canada! So why is it taking so long for our governments to remove these interprovincial trade barriers? After a hundred years, only Alberta looks remotely close, and even they still do government warehousing. Well, there's always a lot of reasons for these things. One is that many small and established businesses benefit from the fact that their competition over the provincial border can't easily come in and compete with them. Large established corporations that know how to work this system also benefit from these hurdles that block upstarts. 
The biggest factor though, in my opinion, well, remember that incredibly labor-intensive monitoring of people's alcohol intake with log books and counter service and racial bias? It lasted for decades longer than it should have. It took until 1969 for self-service to arrive in Ontario, and that bank counter style didn't finally end until the 1990s. At the time, employees at the LCBO said that the self-service thing would never work. It won't reduce the number of staffers required, it won't be any faster, if anything, it'll be slower, and there'll be a lot of shoplifting. Uh, I think you can see where I'm going here. All of this has created thousands of workers across the country who run the distribution and sale of alcohol for our government. If 2020 taught us anything, it's that unions support their workers regardless of if it's good for the public or bad. Anything that reduces the number of unionized workers will usually face resistance. Perhaps nothing epitomizes our current special interest foot shooting better than the beer store in Ontario. The beer store is a state-sanctioned monopoly owned by three massive foreign brewers, Sapporo, Molson Coors, and Anheuser-Busch in Bev. Whenever the government looks into shutting down this ridiculous state-sanctioned extraction of Canadian wealth, do you know who defends them? An Ontario workers' union. And Brewers Retail, who own the beer store, has been at this since 1927. However, only 13% of Ontarians know this. Canadians. Prohibition gave America a lot of baggage. Although Canada started Prohibition before the United States, we never really ended it. Beer probably shouldn't be a buck. There's nothing wrong with alcohol being expensive. Making sure that when alcohol is sold, the huge downstream costs are covered is totally reasonable. But all of that can be much more effectively accomplished with vice taxes. Same thing that we do with tobacco. This very point was suggested in a 2015 government report in Quebec. So as your liquor board revenue drops, you bump up the tax, and at the end, you have a government with a lot more cash. Already in Quebec, brewers send their product to the store, pay their tax, and the SAQ has no knowledge of a transaction. This works because we've gotten pretty good at regulating businesses that sell this sort of stuff. Like, check out what happens in BC when you're caught selling tobacco to a miner. We cannot sell tobacco because we have sold tobacco to a miner in contravention of the Tobacco Control Act. Like a pedo. And how well do you think a liquor store is going to do when it can't sell liquor? On the other hand, a 2011 survey found the LCBO was actually the best place for an underage drinker to acquire alcohol. I doubt the LCBO faces being shut down when it sells liquor to a miner. With that money that the government saves, we could instead have highly paid, unionized staff doing the things that we actually need from the government. Nurses, teachers, social workers, five more arms for the space shuttle. Some things are good to have owned by the public. I think we have a pretty good case at this point for utilities, for example. But a shop? A legally required retail monopoly? And the reason to reassess legacy laws isn't just about spending taxes on things we really need. It's really about maximizing Canada. Because, surprise, this isn't really about beer. Why are we a country? On paper, it looks like a business in Canada has access to a customer base of 40 million people. But often protectionism like this means that they have a fraction of that. And it's not just products, it's also people. We share our labor markets, so if one province needs workers, people from another province can come in and fill that need. But you know how hard it is for a therapist, teacher, or skilled tradesperson to move between provinces? Right now we're pursuing free trade agreements with all these other countries. But to be honest, we probably need one with ourselves first. Agreements like the New West Partnership Trade Agreement are a great start. But it needs to be expanded to a new Canada trade agreement. Because citizens of Canada, lower your defenses, share our world-class products, support each other's industries, Apply your skills where you're needed. And why not start this endeavor with a drink? When you add it all up... <laughs> Pretty sure this was Jeremy's joke. It was Jeremy's fault. Oh God, this is gonna suck ass. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, fuck. I'm too old to drink like this. <laughs> I like wine. I'm actually gonna clear out this because I think I might throw up. <clears throat> Whew. 
Oh, I'm so glad I'm not in university anymore because this is terrible. Oh, it really is a lot of tax. Like, it, I think the thing is I didn't think, oh yeah, that's like half of all of these beers. How fast does your body process liquid? Why did I do this? <coughs> Fuck it. That's a lot of tax. <laughs>